938. Number one for music and entertainment. Vin Diesel, pleasure to be in your company, sir. Good to meet you, Gordon. Now, you, I didn't realise this in advance of coming over to meet you today, but you are fully paid up geek. Like, when it comes to fantasy, you're mad about it. Especially yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, because sure. that laid the kind of the foundations for the film. It did in many ways. Um, it was... Uh, it was my hobby growing up. Um, I grew up in an artist housing in downtown New York City. So the whole community was progressive. Um, in the mid 70s, something called the White Box D&D came out. Um, and my friend's older brother had a, a, a set. And then in 1978, my grandmother got me the base, the red box, which is the basic uh, Dungeons and Dragons. You can only go up to third level or what have you. But from that moment on, it was my favorite pastime. So much so that by the time, and this is when I was a kid, but by the time I was a New York City rough bouncer, yeah. um, on my nights off, <laughs> <laughs> I would be rolling 20-sided dice and playing in this imaginary universe. Uh, this imaginary world uh, called our Dungeons and Dragons campaign. <laughs> um, and then once I, after I did Triple X, um, and I had been, you know, marked as this action hero, uh, Dungeons and Dragons asked me to write the, the foreword to the 30 years of adventure celebrating Dungeons and Dragons. You and must have been full of geek pride. I was <laughs> filled with so much geek pride. I mean, my friends used to wait on long lines uh, on 33rd Street to, to get a copy of their player's handbook signed by Gary Gygax. And I just thought, if they only knew <laughs> that I was writing the foreword. But in the foreword, I talked about a character that I used to play that was a half-drow witch hunter. And I just recently saw um, an interview I did on Conan O'Brien 10 years ago where I talked about this witch hunter. Five years ago, I, I had a, a, a meeting with um, Corey Goodman, the writer, uh, about something unrelated, and we started geeking out about Dungeons and Dragons. And next thing you know, I get this script called The Witch Hunter that was on the blacklist. Um, and then, and now I'm in London talking to you, Gordon, about this movie that uh, we're all excited about. Did you get to see the movie? I got to see it this What'd morning. What do you think? Would well, you know what? It's it because when I first go in to see it, I thought, right, how is this going to play out? I'll be honest with you. I was thinking like because well, the reason being, yeah. fantasy when it's good, like you think Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, <laughs> and then you think of like your old uh, Fast and Furious pal Jason Statham, and he when he did fantasy in the name of the king, it's an absolute disaster. Okay, so it can no go either way. It can yeah. go either way. Yeah. Thankfully, thankfully, everything seemed to go absolutely fine. Uh, but, but was that was there a lot of trepidation though in advance going in because like that like fantasy when you, when you do it right it can be excellent but there is that worry oh, Gordon yeah, you're 100% right um, we only have to look to um, the attempts to Dungeons and Dragons films oh yeah there's but two or three of them and they were horrendous aren't they so it is a kind of a harrowing road um, but you know in this, you know, we did a lot of, of development on this project and and we were lucky to surround ourselves with such great cast. Um, Lord of the Rings taking the poster child for Tolkien Cinematic Universe and of course, I bringing like him yeah. into the movie and going to Game of Thrones and pulling someone from there that everyone loved and, and having her kind of play a different take on witches and kind of represent the benign side of witchcraft or dream walking or magic. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it doesn't get better than Michael Caine. Uh, we've been friends for 13 years and when this opportunity came up for us to work together, we both jumped to it. Mm -hmm. um, at first he thought he needed a driver's license because he thought he was being called in for Fast and Furious. He said, I don't know, I'm <laughs> uh, and, and when you hear that he's coming out of retirement to play the role, that is a good indication that you're on to something. Mm -hmm. um, that was great fun. I, I've been such a huge... And you know what people don't realise as well, Vin? And I know we're caught for time, so i got to wrap this up very shortly. 
But a lot of people don't realise there was a lot of tragedy in your life in advance of shooting this. As, as exciting as it is to, to see this project come to fruition, you're going in off the back of losing a, a very dear friend sure. of Paul Walker. Sure. But that's tough. It was, because the, the truth is, we were going to do The Last Witch Hunter um, years before, and then uh, Universal was so aggressive about um, following a Fast and Furious 6 with Furious 7 that that window got taken away. And so um, when the tragedy happened uh, at the end of 213, uh, my my uh, disposition, my inner feeling was I needed to take a minute, uh, maybe take a year or something off from filming and just allow my uh, allow some time to grieve alone. Um, and two things happened. One is they were successful in getting Michael Caine, which, and they said, you know, I, we know that you want to take a year off, but Michael Caine wants to do this and it's available now um, for the fall of 214. And then the other thing that was fascinating from a kind of approaching a character perspective was, I guess, as crazy as it sounds, there might have been something therapeutic about playing this role um, in my life I was more often than not trying to mask the sorrow anyone that has children will know the last thing you want to do is bring pain or show that um, show a sorrow among, around your children you'd rather not do that so you find yourself masking it at home, but simultaneously masking it for the public. Because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is cry on every show or um, be in a perpetual state of, of, of melancholy. So what was interesting was that there was a parallel between what I was going through and what the character of Calder was going through. You could see it in the first scene with Michael Caine. Uh, Calder's trying to be flippant and write it off like, you know, every day I wake up, the world sleeps easier, I'm cool, what are you talking about? Dolan, there's no problem, I have no problem. And just at the tail end of that scene, you see, just through the cracks, you see that uh, Calder is mourning and hasn't gotten over. Um, the tragedies that he's faced, albeit 800 years ago. Vin, yeah, Vin, I'd love to say and talk to you. Unfortunately, I've got to Me wrap too. it up. Oh, Vin, it's been they a don't give us enough time. Spin 103.8. Number one for music and entertainment.